And I had a good friend tell me about this strategy and because I didn't fully understand it, I dismissed the whole thing and I actually told him it's, it's more than likely a scam and he ought to be very, very careful. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith, and I'm your host today. And our sole purpose is to help the passive investor along their journey to passive investing. We have got an awesome guest here today, a very, very good friend of mine, Mike Bargetto. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Randy. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, hey, Mike, why don't we just jump right into it? Can you you tell the listeners a little bit about your past and your path to passive investing? Yeah, sure. So in, in 2015, we had this crazy idea to go out and buy a lot of rental property, and we ended up doing it. And in three years, we went from one rental to 38 doors, wow. all between single family up to middle or small multifamily. Wow. Um, and I learned something, Randy. I learned that I wasn't super passionate about the day to day operations of real estate. And it wasn't until probably two years ago that we finally hopped in on passive investing. We started investing in these syndications. And the rest is history, right? The mailbox money started coming in and we've, we've actually gone as far as like selling off a decent portion of our portfolio to deploy more and more into passive investments. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. It's, and it's, it's a journey that a lot of active investors follow. Um, you know, we listen to, we listen to the podcast, we read the books, the little purple book, we get all excited about all of the benefits of real estate investing, and then very quickly find that tenants, toilets, and trash is not something we want to be a part of necessarily on an ongoing basis. So now now ramping from one to 35 or 38 in 38. a short period, I can imagine that that's not only a full-time job, that's probably more like two or three time, uh, full-time jobs. It felt like it at times for sure. I, had, I actually left my first career. I was a firefighter for 15 years and I had right. left with the idea that we'd become financially free if I could deploy a good portion of my time into buying assets. And so just, just having that, that, that time available every day to go out and build those relationships, that's what allowed us to build so quickly. Okay. Well, and, and I'm curious then, so did you, did you leave the career prior to going deep with investments or did you start that process prior to going, um, okay. I did, man. I, I had my real estate license uh, before I left the department. Okay. And I think we had one rental at the time. And the thought was, I'll get into real estate sales part time to bring in some income, but yeah. we would rely heavily on my wife's salary for me to go out and buy assets to start throwing off the cash flow. Wow. Okay. So that that moment of truth when you walk into the office. And you throw them the keys to the to the fire truck. I don't know if that's really what it was, but it sounds sounds cool. Um, right. Tell me about that day. How was that day? Was that a scary day? Was that an exciting day? I think I had thought about it for so long before I made the final decision that it was it was easy to go tell the fire captain what I was doing. But I'll never forget walking into his office, sitting down, and he was wondering what was going on. And I just told him like, "I'm done here. I'll give you." A couple of weeks, I'll give you a month, but my time sure. as a firefighter has ended. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. I um, and, and it's interesting because you, it's a great job. I know a lot of folks that spend you know thirty years in that role, and they do extremely well for themselves. Um, but I suspect there was something in you that wanted more than that, which was ultimately driving this. So, I'm curious. Can you talk? Maybe about some of the motivations and the drivers that that were going on in the back of your mind as you're as you're making that decision. Yeah, it was having a, a deep desire of wanting to own as much time as I could. Okay. Having having the days off 
began to be not enough for me. We were we were talking about starting a family. It was just my mm -hmm. wife and I when when I made that decision to leave. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to have kids, and I knew that I wanted to own as much time as possible. And so, real estate was just really exciting for me. We had seen a little bit of success in it up until then, and so I just said, "I'm, I'm going to go in. I can always come back if I if I need to, but sure. I'm going to give this my best shot." Yeah, and and it sounds like you're in a good position to be able to do so. It's it's um, it's interesting that you chose or the driver was time freedom, and then you purchased 38 single family um, <laughs> <laughs> rentals and and rehabs. I think too, you were doing flips and rehabs, all kinds of things. So, uh, did you find your time freedom then with with uh, with real estate investing initially? So I, I I spent a short season in the real estate sales. Okay industry. And I, I realized very quickly that you don't own any of your time in that space. Yeah. Yeah. So that lasted about a year, year and a half as I was acquiring rentals. Um, I think you just have to be diligent on like how you spend your time and what you say yes to. Uh, even though it's a full day coming from the fire service where it's very regimented with someone else having expectations on you, mm -hmm. um, I was fine with the workload that I had because it was it was my doing. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I think you, you get, um, once you get freedom of your own calendar, uh, which is different than freedom of time, freedom of calendar, where you get to decide what you do when you do it with who you do it. That is one stage of financial freedom, time freedom. And yet you, you've, what I found personally is I'm spending more time working more hours, but I have more passion in my day than I've had in years and years. So um, I, I know from knowing you personally that uh, you're a passion driven guy. So um, how exciting. So, okay. So you have all of these homes, then you start to hear about passive investing. I'm guessing talk to me about that transition or what that looked like. I thought that was always like a couple steps away, you know, is buy a bunch of rentals. When you reach financial freedom, then you can diversify Yep. and begin plugging capital into those types of of assets. Um, I don't think I needed to wait as long. Um, however, I will say I learned a ton building that portfolio from, you know, zero to 38 in just a couple of years. Yep. I, my wife, Katie, who's in the business is with us. She jokes that that's how I got my MBA. Uh, just with it. I think, and, and, and this is true for anyone who owns their own business, like it's on you 100% to be the expert, even if you're not yet the expert. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> exactly. It, was, it yeah. was just, it was just a great season of life learning how to have conversations with all these different types of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately you, you created a business that successfully executed the business plan 38 times and produced um, capital. And probably fairly significant income for you and the family during that period, I would suspect. So, yeah. okay. So you go through that process, then you start you start thinking more about passive investing. Um, tell me about that passive investing journey. What did uh, what the first deal look like? What did the due diligence process look like? How'd you find it? Yeah. So I, I guess just like why we got into it. I, I feel like it got to a certain point where we had to. Uh, we, we had heard about this strategy that ended up becoming our bread and butter full-time business that we're going to dive in on in a little bit. But that, that business was something that we were extremely passionate about that, like that is what was driving us. But this, this new portfolio that we had accumulated was taking up so much time that we weren't able to effectively work on things that brought us value and, you know, so we, we, we decided to like start selling off one, one property at a time. Okay. And we just started looking at opportunities within our network. And we just built this buy box for the syndications that we now invest in. We only wanted to work with very large operators, okay. operators that had a proven track record. Um, and we just started having conversations with those types of people. And then once we developed the comfort, then we deployed capital and you already know this because of what you do, but those are the best like due diligence periods because you only have to vet the operator and then check on the new offerings, right? Like it's right. because you're betting on the jockey, not the horse so much. Yep. And so once yep. you, once you have rapport with these operators, you can go out and 
really leverage their knowledge and your relationship with them and deploy and deploy quite a bit of capital quickly uh, to generate that return that you're after. Yep. No, absolutely. I, I had a conversation with another gentleman yesterday and he said he's got two or three different operators that he essentially will do every single deal they put out there indefinitely because he has such trust and such a positive experience with them that um, the operator is already vetted and he knows that if the operator's doing the deal, it's a deal that he wants to be a part of. And, you know, I think ultimately that's the goal of any <clears throat> passive investor is to find a, a small group of operators that are best in class. And then just it, it just becomes a capital placement strategy at that point um, and, and comes down to timing quite often. So, yeah, very you, interesting. Now, go ahead. You don't need to know that many people in this space to be able to be able to deploy capital consistently. That is that is true. And and what you find is most of the folks that are doing a lot of this work, they they all know the big players. Um, right. So it's very easy. Um, it, it's it's easier to vet those bigger players because a lot of people are working with them, right? So now I know you and your your wife um, formed another business because there was another passion that you guys were exposed to. And a lot of people in the space get exposed to, and that was really, um, that was the goal of getting you onto the podcast would be to expose this listener base uh, to this other strategy that so many people are using in this space um, and other spaces as well. So let, let's jump into that and walk us through your path to whole life, if you could. Yeah, sure. So we heard about whole life through this whole infinite banking concept that everyone's talking about right now. This was back in 2017 when we first heard about it. Okay. And I had a good friend tell me about this strategy and because I didn't fully understand it, I dismissed the whole thing and I actually told him it's it's more than likely a scam and he ought to be very very careful. Luckily, he came back to me 3 months later and he said, "You know, I think you ought to have a conversation with my advisor." Um, who sold us our family policies and just learn more about this. Just give it a fair shot. And long story, very, very short. Uh, we ended up falling in love and be we became so enamored with whole life as a product that we ended up starting Axiom Wealth Solutions fully around whole life. And that, and that is what we do full time now. Okay, excellent. So um, I, I had a similar response to it as well. And actually, sure. I'm I'm a Dave Ramsey guy. So most of us know what Dave Ramsey thinks about whole sure. life. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on that. As, as I think a lot of our viewers probably understand, Dave is very, very good for a specific subset of the economy or of the population. But then at some point, I believe you graduate onto another level of financial security, which is what we're really talking about on this podcast. So yeah. um I had a similar response to it as well and was a skeptic um, for quite a while on this as well. So I, I'm hoping, can we spend some time just kind of digging into the nuts and bolts about what is it and how can it help a passive investor? Yeah, absolutely. So just like you would your house, it's our opinion that it's favorable to own your life insurance policy instead of rent your life insurance policy. There is a place for term insurance. Mo most of America should only own term insurance. The free thinkers and people who want to build true wealth are possible candidates for whole life. Okay. Um, and those that do, whole life becomes an amazing place to store capital and increase their wealth without increasing their risk. And so when you, when, when you marry whole life with real estate in this instance, the whole thing works more efficiently. Okay. So, okay, so there there is some benefits to storing capital in a whole life policy. What like what specifically are would be the benefits of storing capital there versus keeping it in a bank where we where we feel like it's safe and secure? Yeah. So one one of our lessons early on in this whole investing space was you have to have capital. If you don't have capital, things are going to be much more difficult for you to grow. Okay. It was it was easy for us both as W two employees at the time to have minimal access to capital because we had the paychecks coming in. We lived off mm -hmm. what we needed and we saved the rest, and it was fine. If you're if you're going out on your own by leaving your job, or if you're doing something like 
aggressive real estate investing, you want to have access to capital. Well, most people store their capital in a savings account, earning them 0%. Sure. And so anytime money hits your bank, the velocity of those dollars just stop. And so the thought with whole life, the reality with whole life is if you can shift your savings pot from a savings account to a whole life policy, you, you never hit zero velocity on those dollars. They're constantly working for you, four to 5% rate of return every year, tax-free. And you can borrow against that cash value account within your life insurance policy and go deploy it into assets. Okay. Yeah, I, I've seen, I've done a lot of reading and I've seen a lot of the literature and I see a lot of examples where they talk about um, leveraging these tools to purchase vehicles, <clears throat> leveraging these tools to purchase second homes or purchase investments. Um, so like mechanically, what does that look like? Is it, um, is it you deposit into an account and then you withdraw it to put it somewhere else? Or what is, what does that actually look like? So I, in the beginning, I thought my biggest hurdle was going to be Dave Ramsey. It's, uh -huh. it's actually not because most people don't want to listen to Dave Ramsey or like you said, they get to a certain spot and they want to graduate from that, that yeah. mindset. Yeah. Our, our biggest hurdle or competition is other invite other advisors in the space. And there, there's a lot of advisors out there saying that if you open up a whole life policy, take a policy loan against your cash value and go out and buy a truck or a Lamborghini, you're going to somehow <laughs> right. build wealth. Right. Um, I have, I have run all the numbers that can be ran. There, 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 there's no way you can buy a liability and become wealthy. And okay. so you thank have to you, be very, first of all, for saying that. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for asking the question. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to be very careful with who you work with uh, okay. when it comes to whole life. Okay. Thank you. Cause it, it does um, flashy sells, um, but it also breeds contempt and, and questions, I think, in my mind. So any, any savvy, savvy investor will see the guys buying the, Lam the Lambo um, with their whole life and question that. So at the end of the day, a purchase still needs to make sense 100%. for it to make sense with whole life or anything else. Okay. Okay. So, um, so a, a lot of times, like myself included, um, recently departed the W-2. Um, I had... Uh, I had uh, life insurance through my W-2, uh, but that will be ending soon. So um, I, I don't need to be sold on the fact that I need life insurance to make sure my family is taken care of when and if I do pass away. Okay. Um, so the challenge becomes getting over this hurdle of depositing money into a whole life account versus depositing into my bank account where you know, the rainy day fund is always there. So um, how do you talk about that and help some of your clients overcome that challenge? I think a rainy day fund is the perfect set of like, or portion of capital that ought to be in a whole life policy because it's there liquid for you when you need it. Yeah. What we don't advise people on is every dollar that they have for investing should not go into the whole life policy because then you're going to put it in and pull it out and go invest it. There's, we always put emphasis on, on, on having access to as much capital as you can. And so with the whole, whole life conversation, there's, there's a mindset shift that has to happen. If you want to make it in the real estate space and reach financial freedom that way, or any other way, we need to, inc we need to decrease our financial inefficiencies. We need to look at where we're putting our dollars and ask if, if, if those places are actually helping us achieve our goal. And I think a lot of, I think a goal for a lot of your audience is reaching financial freedom. And if they're there, it's expanding their wealth from there. Right. So yeah. decreasing financial inefficiencies by, by, by pulling dollars that don't align with their goals. And for us, it's putting those dollars in a whole life policy or a portion of them into a whole life policy, whatever you okay. don't need okay. in there, you then deploy to an asset that hopefully throws off cash flow. Okay. Okay. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Definitely. And I've, I've heard some strategies um, tying this back to um, real estate passive investing where folks will deposit funds into or, or um, put dollars into a whole life policy and then take loans to purchase LP positions in syndications. 
Yeah. Um, and and there there seems to be an arbitrage of of um, fees that you pay, but then dollars that you <clears throat> earn through um, returns on your dollars that are that are in the existing plan. So, what does that look like at a high level? Uh, just sure. so our our listeners understand what that looks like. Yeah. So so net of all fees inside the policy, you're going to earn four to five percent annually. Okay. And so long as you utilize the policy loan function meaning you're borrowing against the policy, against the dollars that are in the policy. You're not actually debiting from the cash value like you would in a, in a checking or savings account. So long as you borrow against it, the four to 5% compounding in the policy never gets interrupted. Okay. And that's what allows for more efficient wealth accumulation. So you're actually earning, earning a return on dollars even if you've taken a loan on those dollars to use elsewhere. Whether you use the dollars or you don't, you're not actually using your dollars, you're using dollars from the life insurance company. The okay. compounding never interrupts. And that's from day one when you go in force on a life insurance policy to the last day that you have on earth. Okay. And so okay. four to five percent, if you just isolate that on one year, four to five percent isn't all that attractive necessarily, even if it's tax free, which it is. But when we can do that 24 7, 365 for the rest of your life, without without risk then yeah. there's there's massive growth and so the idea there to take this one step further is one one once you deploy capital say it's in an lp that investment throws off cash flow because we took a policy loan against our policy we now have a home for those dollars and instead mm -hmm. of putting it in our checking and savings account we send it back to the policy to continue that four to five percent rate of return got it and and the whole time there's a death benefit that exists as well Correct. That's it. That's it. Okay. And something else we find, Randy, is a lot of people who either own or rent their life insurance policy don't have enough death benefit. We see 250000 all day long. When in reality, getting $2 million in death benefit is, is not that expensive. Okay. Yeah, which I think is a really good question and one that comes up quite often. Um, how much death benefit do you think somebody should have? Depending on your age, you can get up to 30 times your annual income. Okay. But I think it's a personal question that, every, that each and every person has to answer. It's if I were to pass away early, sure. what do I need to provide my spouse if I'm married so she yeah. can raise the kids because she's never going to get any, other, any more production from me? Right. And, and you know, you and I had a conversation a couple of months ago and I asked the question of really kind of self-insuring. Once I get to a certain level where I have... X amount of dollars in my bank account, um, kind of like our, our number that we think if we hit that, we're comfortable and myself or my wife could actually be okay for the rest of our lives. Um, when I asked you, if we hit that number, do we still need insurance? You asked a really, really powerful question that I've been thinking about and pondering ever since it was, if you died today, um, your quality of life that your remaining life, your remaining family would get, their quality of life would not improve over time. And if you continue to live and bring value to the family and continue to grow your nest egg, the quality of life would continue to grow. So do you want the quality of life to impact, be impacted if you were to pass away, which I think was really, really powerful. And it really hit me personally um, to think that, yes, I don't want my wife um, or my daughter to um, be harmed in any way if I were to pass. Uh, so it, I don't know if you have any color you want to add to that or anything else. You may have said that better than I said it. I'm not sure. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think you. I think you hit that square on the head, man. Um, okay. The more successful we get, the higher our human life value becomes. Sure. And sure, you can't you can't take any of this with us, right? It stays here after we leave. Yeah. Of course, we want to set up the family yep. uh, in the event that we leave early. But also, you start having conversations with yourself and your spouse of like, what sort of impact can we make on the world? Mm -hmm. If I can get a life insurance policy that doesn't really have a cost over time, it, it actually makes us money. Mm -hmm. But then we can leave a multi-million dollar death benefit to an organization, a charity, etc., Man, you start having you start having some deep, very very important conversations with yourself. Yep. 
Yeah, very good. So I, I'm curious, what are what are some of the kind of the, the misconceptions or um, challenges you run into talking with folks about this? What are some of those beliefs that people have that maybe aren't true about whole life? I, th I think a lot of people think whole life as a product is a scam. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a time tested tool. It's been around for almost 200 years. The life insurance companies that we work with are some of the oldest institutions in our country. Um, but you have to buy the right policy and the policy has to be very, very specific to your strategy. Back in the day before this whole bank on yourself thing came about, mm -hmm. the cash value wasn't necessarily there in the early years. And we call those base policies because the dollars that you put in are just put towards base premium and base premium buys death benefit. And so if you bought a base policy then or now, you have a very, very high death benefit, but no cash value in the early years. That can fit some people's needs, but for a lot of people in the space who are trying to de deploy more capital to get more cash flow, you want to go overfunded. And if you can get a properly structured, overfunded whole life policy, um, then all, all of the misconceptions go out the window. It's, it. it's a very stable asset that you get to have in your portfolio. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I, you know, you mentioned this earlier about <laughs> kind of tax-free benefit that comes along with this. And of course, we'll, we'll labor it with the, we're not, we're not CPAs. Please talk to your CPA about this, but can you talk to some of the tax benefits of the dollars and the returns that are deposited into these, these tools? So first the death benefit is delivered income tax-free to your heirs. The cash value is tax-free forever, so long as you borrow against it. You can take distributions, and this is a strategy for some people down the road when they enter retirement. You can take distributions, not loans, but actual debits from your cash value account, tax-free up to your basis. But you can take policy loans tax-free because we don't tax debt okay. at any point for any reason at any time in your life. Okay. Okay. And, and my understanding is that you could, um, I could get a policy for my daughter, my wife, my uncle, my aunt, my mom, my dad. Um, like I could, I could personally get a policy on anybody that would agree to me having a policy on them. Is that correct? So you have to have an insurable interest on, okay. on someone in order to get a policy on them. So your spouse, of course, yes. Your children, yes. A business partner, we do a lot of key man policies. Okay. You have to have an insurable interest. And so some clients come to us and they go through our entire process and they learn that they don't qualify based on age or health. Hmm. So the next question we ask is, well, who in your life do you have an insurable interest in that you can get a policy on them? And then they become the policy owner and they get to utilize all those benefits, but on another person. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I've been for years putting dollars into a 529 plan for my daughter and you and I have discussed me shifting those dollars over to a plan and granted she's a freshman. So we only have, you know, hopefully four years left to deposit into that before she does whatever she's going to do after high school. Um, what I like about this plan is that it, it gives many more options than a 529 plan does because you're limited to just educational disbursements with a 529. So um, can you talk about some of those benefits and what it looks like for getting a policy for a child? A lot of our clients have young children and they have a longer runway before their, their, their kids go to college and having access to those funds, just like you would in your own whole life policy allows you to make very, very efficient decisions on your dollars. So when money is tied up in a 529 and you don't have access to it, like you said, there's penalties if that capital is not used or if that cash is not used for educational purposes. This is something that if you have a policy on your kid, they can use it for college, but they get to own that policy for the rest of their lives. They get mm -hmm. to use it for buying their first car, mm -hmm. college, their wedding, their first house, investment properties. And so if you can, if you can also throw in a little bit of the mindset shift with a whole life policy, your kids are just going to be set up so much yeah. differently. Yeah. It, it really puts them in a position. Um, I would have loved to have been in 
as you know right. an 18 or 20 or 25 or, or 40 year old quite frankly um well, very good. Like, I think you answered a ton of questions. I apologize if it seemed a little kind of rapid fire questions, but I think this is a, this is a strategy that our listeners at a minimum need to be aware of, certainly need to consider and, um, need to educate themselves on. Because what I find is that the people that I, I respect that are extremely wealthy, a very large portion of those people are leveraging these tools. And that in and of itself tells me that it's something that I need to investigate further and become more comfortable with and ultimately start to leverage myself. So, um, Mike, you've brought a tremendous amount of value around this space. I appreciate that. I, I love how, um, how you integrated it into your story and the benefits we can bring into passive investing. Um, so just a really, really neat solution. So thank you for that. Thanks so much, Randy. Yeah, and well, let's let's do this too. I've got a couple of fun questions that I like to ask everybody as well. Sure. Um, so hopefully you've done your homework and can respond just with great zeal. I don't know, but um, <laughs> anyway, what? So tell me if you can, um, like, what type of resources would you suggest to somebody that is trying to learn more about um, whole life um, and more life, more about the, the strategies that you've learned? There's a great book called The And Asset. It's a quick read. It's a hundred or so pages. Um, we read that when we were already in the space and we had read a few books before then. And that book just hit home. That's what that's the book we send all of our clients, people who are curious about it. I would definitely check out The And Asset. Okay. Um, and you can also check out our newest YouTube channel, Money Secrets with Mike and Kate. Okay. Money we're throwing out content on whole life and we're also just talking about how to uh, how to obtain financial freedom okay fantastic and you certainly have experience with that um, let's do kind of a fun one here is there a recent bucket list item that you have checked off of your bucket list <laughs> yeah so last summer uh, we we ended up spending the summer in Lake Tahoe I think you would agree it gets a little it gets a little hot in Phoenix Valley little toast. So yeah. We we wanted to leave for the summer. We went to Lake Tahoe and I wrapped up that family trip with walking the Tahoe Rim Trail. It was a 14-day, 175-mile trip that I solo through hiked uh, and it was incredible. It was a lot Fantastic. of fun. Fantastic. Yeah, so you like you like to set some hefty goals and chase after them accomplished. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thanks. Now, with that, just coming off of that of knowing um, I personally have checked a couple of big bucket lists off. So I know when I come back at times, you can kind of hit the the doldrums a little bit. What type of bucket <laughs> list items do you have on the list that you're hoping to check off in the near future? I think more so than that, than that backpacking excursion, the, the time away with family uh, in Tahoe at the family cabin, just, just spending time with each other, with our, mm -hmm. with our young kids was it was a huge value add to us in the moment, but also when, when we came home and we had to hit the regular life again. And so what we're trying to do is just continue to be extremely intentional with our time and how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about spending every summer away from home and in a really cool spot. It doesn't have to be Tahoe every year, but we're thinking about exploring another location next year. I love it. I love it. And I think ultimately um, to kind of bring this thing full circle, going back to the decision you made when you left the, the, um, your, your fireman position, um, like getting time freedom and calendar freedom. You, you've certainly been able to do that over the last handful of years that uh, now you and your family get to experience this time together that uh, your kids will remember forever, you'll remember forever. And it's just years that you just don't ever get back. So congratulations on, on achieving that. That's amazing. That's it. Thanks. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Mike. It was certainly a pleasure. Um, I consider you a great friend. I was super excited to have you on this podcast. Um, so thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me, Randy. This was awesome. Awesome. And to our listeners, what I'd encourage you to do, if, if you have any interest in this at all, um, which I think you should, uh, definitely reach out to Mike, um, get some time on the calendar with him, spend some time getting to know this. Mike is not 
Mike is not one of these high pressure salespeople that, that you think of. Mike is just a great resource that's providing value to this community. So reach out to him, connect, follow his YouTube, and uh, I'm sure you'll be happy with the value that you get from him. So um, with that, listeners, thank you so much for joining us again today. And we'll look forward to having you on our next episode. Thank you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.